Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another TPD seminar. Uh, we have a fantastic speaker here today. Uh, professor Dan Namora is a professor of chemical biology and molecular therapeutics in the Department of Chemistry and the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology in the Division of Molecular Therapeutics at UC Berkeley and an investigator at the Innovative Genomics Institute. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry at UCSF. Since 2017, has, he has also been the director of the Novartis Berkeley Translational Chemical Biology Institute, focused on using chemoproteomic platforms to tackle the undruggable proteome. He is also a co-founder of Frontier Medicines and the founder of Sonatus Therapeutics, based on his group's discovery of the DubTAC platform. Dan is also on the SAB for a long list of biotechs that I could not go through. Uh, among his many honors includes the National Cancer Institute Outstanding Investigator Award, Cyril Scholar, American Cancer Society Research Scholar Award, and the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research Aspire Award. Now I'm gonna hand that over to you, Dan. Thanks a lot. Um, and just first off, you know, I've been a huge fan of this uh, Dana-Farber TPD webinar series and, uh, you know, certainly, I think my lab has uh, religiously watched this uh, seminar series. So thank you for doing this uh, for the whole you know, TPD community. I think it's been uh, an incredible resource for, for the whole community. So thank you for the invite to give a talk here today. Um, before I begin, these are my disclosures and conflicts of interest. Um, all right, so our lab is, is really, really interested in tackling the undruggable proteome, which I think is still very much the biggest bottleneck that we face in drug discovery, that over 90% of human proteins are considered undruggable uh, because most proteins um, you know, don't really possess well-defined binding pockets that a small molecule can bind to to affect their function. So very likely, if you discover a new disease target, you're not going to be able to develop a drug against it very easily using any current uh, available therapeutic modality. Uh, whether it's small molecules or degraders or you know things beyond degraders or gene therapy or cell therapy or anything um so what are undruggable proteins well unlike you know uh or what are undruggable proteins unlike druggable proteins like enzymes or receptors that have well-defined binding pockets that a small molecule can bind to undruggable proteins include things like protein complexes or intrinsically disordered proteins where it's really unclear where within these smooth interfaces or garbled messes like this you can identify binding pockets that you can pharmacologically interrogate um, and in cancer, we've known for decades so many different drivers of cancer like RAS and MYC and P53 uh, that are oncogenic or tumor suppressor drivers of cancer, yet except in the case of KRAS G12C mutations and now a couple of others, uh, other mutant forms of RAS or other forms of RAS or, you know, intrinsically disordered transcription factors like MYC or mutationally inactivated and, and sometimes unfolded uh, tumor suppressors like P53 still remain really, really uh, difficult for direct drug discovery approaches. And these four proteins just represent the tip of the iceberg of tens of thousands of other protein targets that remain intractable to direct drug discovery approaches. And so our premise has always been that if we can identify these binding pockets or ligandable hotspots across all proteins in the proteome, we could really uh, effectively go after liganding any protein and, and subsequently developing uh, new disease therapies. And I think, you know, as the chemical biology field has really evolved, uh, you know, with technologies like fragment-based drug discovery or computational approaches or chemoproteomics or DNA-encoded libraries, our ability to find binders for proteins has, has really exponentially increased. But I think one of the realizations that, that we're all seeing is that uh, simply finding binders to proteins alone is often insufficient to functionally manipulate their, their um, roles in, in a way that would therapeutically be beneficial. And oftentimes you need to then uh, couple that with other therapeutic modalities like targeted protein degradation in order to force functionality on that protein. Um, and uh, that can oftentimes be also very challenging. And so another major uh, goal within our lab has been to really expand the arsenal of new therapeutic modalities that we can mix and match with ligands uh, to really enable kind of the next generation of drug discovery. And so to do this, uh, we've been using chemical proteomics or chemoproteomics and coupling that with covalent chemistry to be able to discover ligandable sites and ligand those sites directly in complex biological systems. And we've also been using these strategies to really expand the scope of targeted protein degradation approaches, which uh, will be the majority of the focus of my talk today. Uh, and then also uh, inducing the proximity of proteins to destroy them is just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with this kind of approach. In fact, not every protein benefits from destroying it. And so we're also going beyond degradation to develop new induced proximity-based therapeutic approaches 
uh, all towards discovering new therapeutic targets and drugs. And so the underlying chemoproteomic approach that we use uh, is an approach that was pioneered by my former postdoc mentor, Ben Kravat at Scripps Research called activity-based protein profiling, uh, which uses reactivity-based chemical probes to profile proteome-wide reactive functional and ligandable sites uh, directly in complex biological systems. And the way this works is that we have a series of electrophilic reactive probes that can covalently modify nucleophilic amino acid hotspots within proteins like serine, cysteines, and lysines that not only take place in enzyme catalysis, but also post-translational regulation, protein-protein interaction, allosteric binding, protein-protein interactions, or really any kind of, you know, ligandable site that these molecules can access. And you can read those events out because all of these probes burn alkyne handles, so you can use copper-catalyzed click chemistry to append on your analytical handle, whether it's a, a fluorophore like rhodamine or a biotin enrichment handle. Um, and so showing you here various examples of reactivity-based probes that the chemical biology field has made through the years for, for example, serine or cysteine or lysine or methionine reactivity. And you can see all of these possess these uh, red reactive electrophilic warheads as well as these blue uh, biorthogonal handles. And so in a typical experiment, you can take any kind of complex proteome and you can throw in your reactive probe and the probe will broadly react across tens of thousands of ligandable sites across the proteome. And you could subsequently read that out by clicking on uh, uh, some you know variant of a cleavable uh, biotinase I tag onto your probe label proteins, and you could subsequently enrich those proteins with avidin, digest your proteins to release your tag, uh, and subsequently you know isolate your probe modified tryptic peptides, which you can shoot onto the mass spec to identify the sites of probe labeling. And many of these sites of probe labeling now constitute potential ligandable sites that can now be pharmacologically interrogated uh, using covalent small molecules. And collectively now, in you know, many labs and have been doing this uh, across the country, you know, collectively, when you aggregate all of these chemoproteomic data sets, we've now identified over, you know, 100,000 of these potential ligandable sites across really the vast majority of the human proteome. And we've arrayed these into a, a database where we can really search for any protein target of interest now. And what's really cool about this is that we can quantitatively assess the reactivity of specific cysteines within targets or lysines or other amino acids um, and really identify where these aberrantly reactive nucleophilic sites are that oftentimes correspond to uh, ligandable sites within these proteins. Um, but simply identifying pockets within proteins alone is insufficient to develop small molecule ligands against them. And so we've also built out or purchased in tens of thousands of these small molecule libraries that possess these red reactive warheads. So for example, in this case of cysteine, if you find a cysteine reactive hotspot with this broad promiscuous idocetamide probe, uh, we've built out large libraries of acrylamides and chlorocetamide warheads that have tempered reactivity that can irreversibly react to thiols. And by diversifying the R groups here, we can confer specificity for certain cysteines over others. And you can deploy these in pure protein target screens where you can screen a ligand library and if the ligand binds to your protein compared to your control, when you chase with a fluorophore tag reactive probe, the probe can no longer bind to those sites. So it's a simple competitive assay. And you can read that out as loss of fluorescence in a gel-based format or high-throughput screening format. Or these days, uh, we can rely on the Agile Rapid Fire TOF system, which is an incredibly powerful approach for doing high-throughput intact protein mass spectrometry-based screening to identify covalent binders for proteins. But most importantly, you could do this directly in complex biological systems where you can envision treating your covalent ligand in vivo in a human or a mouse or cells or lysates, and the ligand will irreversibly bind to whatever protein targets it's going to bind to compared to your control. So when you chase with an alkyne functionalized reactive probe, the probe can no longer bind to those sites. So it's a simple competitive assay across the whole proteome now, which you can then quantitatively read out by clicking on isotopically encoded mass tags, taking it through this whole process, and now identifying uh, where your ligand displaced probe labeling, allowing you to identify exactly which amino acid or which protein target you're looking bound to, and also how selectively it bounded that site on a protein-wide scale. So these technologies have now been around for, for quite a while. Uh, again, you know, really pioneered by efforts by Ben Kravat and, and uh, his team. And uh, what this really enables you to do is a lot of different things. So if you already know what target you want to go after, you can use this approach to assess target engagement and also uh, assess proteomite selectivity. So you can couple that with medicinal chemistry efforts to not only optimize potency against your target, but also proteomite selectivity um, and, and also to reduce any kind of toxicological off-target liabilities. Another major advantage of this is that you can use this to uh, enable target identification of covalent small molecules that come out of phenotypic screens and uh, really shorten the time uh, to, to kind of deconvolute the mechanism of action of, of molecules that come out of these chemical genetic approaches. 
And so what we've been doing with this, we've been taking our covalent ligand libraries and screening them in various target-based and biochemical and phenotypic screens. And once we identify small molecule hits, we can then very rapidly deconvolute their mechanism of action uh, using chemoproteomic strategies. So uh, another thing that, that, that's really been attractive uh, for using chemoproteomic approaches has also been to uh, expand the scope of, of emerging and new therapeutic modalities, uh, including, for example, in targeted protein degradation, where in targeted protein degradation, we have kind of two of these approaches, right, with these heterobifunctional protacs and these monovalent molecular glue degraders, where oftentimes the challenge is actually finding the ligand against your target or finding the recruiter against, you know, E3 ligases beyond kind of the two main E3 ligase recruiters that are used. Um, and also another kind of major challenge has been to more chemically rationally design these kinds of molecular glue degrader molecules uh, to be able to engage uh, either E3 ligases or neosubstrates. Um, but covalent chemoproteomic approaches can really help in, in expanding the scope of these kinds of approaches. And again, you know, now with uh, all the different technologies at our disposal in the chemical biology field for ligand binding uh, discovery, um, you know, we can really think beyond degradation. Um, again, not every protein benefits from destroying it uh, for therapeutic activity. Uh, and so uh, we need to really develop the arsenal of other therapeutic modalities to be able to more precisely manipulate either post-translational modifications on proteins, proteins themselves, or even nucleic acids like DNA and RNA or the genome targets. Uh, but we now have, I think, the capabilities to develop recruiters against really any effector protein to envision, right, uh, developing the full complement and arsenal of induced proximity paradigms, whether it's through the heterobifunctional approaches or through molecular glue approaches, uh, you know, beyond degradation. And so this is an area that we're uh, heavily investing in. Uh, and so, Starting off, I, I, I realize I, I probably talked about this particular story uh, last time already uh, when I gave this talk, uh, I think three or four years ago. But, you know, in cancer, I think still we, we know so many different drivers of cancer, yet uh, only a small fraction of them have any kind of small molecule associated with them. And it's because most of these targets are still among the undruggable class of proteins. Yet, if you mine our ligandability database, we've identified ligandable sites across really the vast majority of uh, all the cancer drivers. And uh, we can go after, I think, now targets like, for example, MYC, which has eluded kind of drug discovery approaches because much of MYC is highly intrinsically disordered. This is an amplified transcription factor that um, is a major driver of many, many different cancers uh, through uh, upregulating the transcription of hundreds of cell proliferation genes. Um, and our ligandability database, uh, for example, has clearly shown us that the cysteine 171 is an aberrantly reactive cysteine that is embedded within this intrinsically disordered region of MYC. And, uh, you know, I've talked about this before, and this is all published from several years ago now, but we were able to discover this covalent ligand EN4 that seems to uh, selectively target this uh, intrinsically disordered cysteine 171 within MYC. Um, and... I guess what's not necessarily reported in this paper, because we uh, figured this out uh, a few days after our paper was published, uh, is that what this act ends up causing is actually a targeted destabilization event where targeting the cysteine, this intrinsically disordered cysteine, causes a thermodynamic destabilizing event within MYC, ultimately leading to what we think is likely an unfolded protein response and ubiquitination and degradation of MYC. And that really leads to profound inhibition of MYC transcriptional activity and um, anti-cancer effects. Now, this was kind of fortuitously stumbled upon, and uh, we kind of, um, you know, didn't really follow it up uh, for, for a while. But uh, this concept, I think, of targeted destabilization, particularly of these intrinsically disordered regions within, for example, transcription factors to induce their degradation, I think, is something that we've actually now seen a couple of times over in in, in other stories uh, that, that I won't reveal yet. But um, I think... Potentially, this is a, a unique strategy that we're really thinking about for, you know, drugging these really difficult to drug transcription factors in cancer. So, you know, if you look at our ligandability database uh, of now over 120,000 ligandable sites, not surprisingly, the vast majority of those sites are within highly ordered regions. But a good 12%, over 14,000 sites, are aberrantly reactive uh, cysteines in this case. Uh, that are within intrinsically disordered regions of proteins. And within those are proteins like MYC, but also many, many other targets uh, that are of high value in, in cancer and uh, something that we've uh, 
uh, you know, kind of systematically started going after. And I think this is something that hopefully will become an emerging theme that you'll see coming out of our lab uh, in, in coming uh, months to years. <clears throat> but going back to protax and heterobifunctional modalities, um, you know, one of the challenges in this field is that uh, we have over 600 E3 ligases in, in the human genome. But primarily, we've still relied on, on two E3 ligase recruiters. One is with the thalidomide class of molecules that bind the cerebellum, and another one is with the BHL recruiters. And uh, it's becoming clear that you know, these two E3 ligase recruiters are likely not going to be sufficient to be able to degrade every and any target of interest. And so having a larger expanded arsenal of E3 ligase recruiters uh, can be beneficial. Uh, and I think now you know, this field is really taken off where there are many different strategies that one can take to, to really expand upon E3 ligase recruiters. But covalent chemoproteomic approaches have certainly uh, contributed to this. So, so we've previously published on, for example, this covalent natural product, uh, Nimbolide, that targets RNF114 that you can use in Protax, or for example, RNF4 covalent recruiters, or in collaboration with Michael Rapa's group, uh, FEM1B recruiters uh, that you can use. Uh, to degrade neosubstrate proteins in an on-target, uh, you know, E3 ligase-dependent manner. And, and certainly, we've been able to expand upon covalent recruiters for E3 ligases. Uh, this is something that Ben Kravat and Xiaoyu Zhang have also expanded upon. And, and uh, more recently, DNA-encoded library technologies have really contributed to further expanding upon these kinds of recruiters. And uh, I think the Structural Genomics Consortium has also uh, recently published on a, on a uh, nanomolar or novel E3 ligase recruiter uh, that you can use in, in targeted protein degradation applications. But uh, if you mine our ligandability database, we've right now identified ligandable sites across over 98% of the over 600 E3 ligases. And, and we've, in fact, published this in the supporting materials of this review that we've uh, recently published in, in biochemistry. So you can go in there and kind of search for your favorite E3 and look at whether there are potentially aberrantly reactive cysteines um, within your favorite E3. But I think, uh, uh, you know, a better approach potentially to, to degrading targets is using monovalent molecular glue degraders. Uh, while there have been huge strides made uh, for developing protax into orally bioavailable and even brain penetrant uh, degrader molecules, uh, these things still tend to be larger molecular weight and uh, challenging for medicinal chemistry applications. Um, whereas with monovalent glue degraders, uh, you know, these molecules are smaller molecular weight and can also often access shallow pockets across protein interfaces uh, to be able to glue, for example, an E3 ligase with a neosubstrate to ubiquitinate and degrade those proteins. Um, and then obviously an example of a molecular glue degrader is thalidomide, which binds the cerebellum to glue it to neosubstrates like sulfur and icarose to ubiquitinate and degrade them. And it was the sulfur degradation that led to the birth defects, but and icarose degradation that led to anti-cancer effects. Um, now it's been thought that right, like thalidomide type molecules are are like you know uh, one in a billion type molecules, and and you're not going to be able to like just systematically discover these things. But I think uh, a lot of work done at Dana Farber and and many other institutions have revealed right uh, that these things can be more systematically discovered uh, and inspired by work. Uh, done by Garrett Winter's uh, group and uh, Christina Mayer Ruiz's group, um, we have also started taking kind of systematic approaches to discover new molecular glue degraders through various phenotypic screens. And uh, these days we're taking more kind of target centric cellular glue degrader screens, but uh, upfront we kind of did a very crude kind of cell death screen uh, for anti cancer phenotypes where the approach that we took to discover new molecular glue degraders was to screen our cysteine reactive covalent ligand libraries. So these are covalent small molecules uh, for anti-cancer effects and then counter screening for you know, molecules that showed attenuated phenotypes upon either you know, treatment in the hyponatylation line or with treatment with a natylation inhibitor uh, for inhibiting colony three ligases to identify molecules uh, for which mechanism of action was likely going to be through some molecular glue degradation event. Uh, and again, uh, you know, deconvoluting the mechanism of these things uh, oftentimes is pretty challenging. You know, functional CRISPR screens have really arisen as a, as a powerful approach. But we thought that we could, you know, further kind of accelerate this approach by using, you know, covalent chemoproteomic approaches to help deconvolute the mechanism, right, of, of whatever molecular glue degrader that came out of our screens, and then use subsequently quantitative proteomic approaches to figure out what target we degraded to be able to reassemble the ternary complex. Um, and so uh, Ellie King, a, a chemical biology graduate student in our lab, took this on 
Um, and uh, she initially screened our systemic active covalent ligand library to look for molecules that showed anti-cancer activity in HAP1 leukemia cancer cells. Uh, and then she counter-screened any HIST that came out to look for attenuation of phenotype um, in uh, with a colonetylation E3 ligase uh, inhibitor. Uh, and what she found out of that was this covalent, really tiny fragment, EM450, uh, that seemed to kill cancer cells, but that phenotype was attenuated with the MLN4924 compound, the nettylation inhibitor, to the same extent, really, as uh, the molecular glue degrader that Garrick Winter uh, had discovered. And um, because this is cysteine reactive, we used our covalent chemoproteomic approaches to map the global cysteine reactivity of this molecule. And uh, among the targets, obviously, this thing is pretty tiny, so it's not wholly selective, but um, among the targets uh, that we identified, uh, there was really only one uh, protein that was involved in the ubiquitin proteasome system, and that was this allosteric cysteine 111 on this E2 uh, ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, UBE2D. Now, there are four different isoforms of UBE2D, UBE2D1 through 4, um, and they're basically like 98% identical in sequence, and so including this uh, cysteine 111. So we actually can't distinguish between the cysteine on UB1 through 4, it's very likely that this molecule is binding to all four UBE2Ds. Um, but nonetheless, we validated this interaction. We made an alkyne functionalized probe version of EM450 that, again, uh, kills cancer cells, but that phenotype is completely attenuated with a nettylation inhibitor. Uh, we can take pure UBE2D1 protein and show dose-responsive covalent labeling of uh, of the protein with our alkyne probe handle. Uh, and then we can also show that we can pull out UBE2D1, but not unrelated proteins like GAP-DH uh, out of cells and that we can outcompete that with excess uh, EM450. And so then we wanted to establish whether you know this uh, E2 was actually responsible for some of the cell viability impairments. And so we knocked down UBE2D1 uh, in HAP1 cells and we can show that that uh, anti-cancer phenotype is significantly attenuated, the dose response curve is shifted uh, if you knock down UB2D1. Um, and so then we wanted to figure out the other half of this equation. What were we actually degrading? And so we did quantitative proteomic approaches to look at what proteins were changing in uh, protein levels upon EM450 treatment. And one dot showed up. So uh, the thing that it looked like we were taking out was this nuclear transcription factor NF-kappa B1, which has been shown to have uh, oncogenic properties in cancer cells. And you can see that NF-kappa B is uh, uh, reduced in levels by EM450 treatment, and that's attenuated uh, with the methylation inhibitor. Um, and so, you know, that showed us, you know, potentially that what we were doing was that this covalent molecule was covalently attaching to UB2D and engaging in molecular glue interactions with this transcription factor NF-kappa B1 uh, to induce its polyubiquitination and subsequently proteasome-mediated degradation. And to further show the ternary complex was being formed, uh, we pulled down NF-kappa B in the presence of EM450, and you can see enhanced pull down of the E2 UB2D1. Furthermore, we reconstituted the whole kind of uh, colon E3 ligase complex um, and show that it's uh, only in the presence of the kind of colon complex in the presence of NF-kappa B and e, uh, EM450 that we see this enhanced ubiquitination of NF-kappa B1, both looking at flag ubiquitin as well as uh, NF-kappa B polyubiquitination as well, showing that this ternary complex is resulting in a productive ternary complex, uh, resulting in enhanced ubiquitination of this substrate uh, in a reconstituted system. Um, and so it looks like... Uh, the E2 is not interacting by itself or with a, like a ring E3 or something. It, it, does, it still does require the, the full complement of the, the colon E3 ligase uh, you know, uh, complex. And so uh, we also were able to show, well, you know, we believe that probably the full anti-cancer activity of the CM450 molecule is due to not just this molecular glue degrader interaction, but probably you know, other off-targets that this, this molecule might have. At least some of the anti-cancer effects are attenuated uh, with the M450 treatment if you overexpress NF-kappa B uh, in these cells, and and so you know it indicates that at least part of the anti-cancer activity uh, may be mediated through this uh, unique molecular glue interaction between uh, this E2 uh, and this transcription factor. Um, and so this was unique in that you know uh, so far uh, E2s haven't really been exploited in either molecular glue degrader interactions or in targeted protein degradation approaches, but it, it indicated that this 
Alistair cysteine 111 that we had targeted that is distal from the actual ubiquitin conjugating cysteine, cysteine 85 on, on UB2D, uh, seemed to be an exploitable site for recruitment of neosubstrates. And so one thing that we wanted to explore was whether we could actually exploit that site kind of going backwards from molecular glues back to heterobifunctionals in, in protac applications. And so uh, a very talented postdoc in our lab, Nafsika Forte, uh, took this on where she linked this uh, original kind of molecular glue degrader uh, E2 uh, covalent ligand uh, EM450 to the BRD4 inhibitor JQ1. Uh, this thing still binds in a dose-responsive manner to UB2D2. We can see competition of this molecule against systemic active probe labeling of recombinant UB2D2. Um, and when we treat this in cells, interestingly, we do see degradation of BRD4, uh, but we only actually see uh, selective degradation of the short BRD4 ice form, and really it's not touching at all the long ice form of BRD4. Uh, we're still not exactly clear what the mechanism of this selectivity is, uh, but initially, the degradation that we were observing was not that particularly robust. You see that, you know, a good, like, chunk of BRD4 is still left over here, right? Um, now, this molecule obviously came out of a phenotypic screen. It's completely unoptimized. Uh, it's not like we screened directly against uh, the E2. And so we did a more target-centric screen, uh, screening our whole systemic active covalent ligand library against uh, this E2. Uh, and we identified a, a better scaffold with this EN67 molecule that binds to UB2D2 directly. And when we reconstitute uh, the E3 ligase ubiquitination activity of this molecule, we see that uh, EN67 doesn't inhibit ubiquitination activity, uh, which we expected because this is likely targeting that allosteric cysteine 111, but not the ubiquitin conjugating cysteine 85. Uh, we further confirmed this uh, by you know, taking recombinant UB2D protein and showing by mass spec that this is uh, selectively labeling just the cysteine 111 on UB2D. Uh, we also further made an alkyne functionalized probe version of EN67 and showed that this still binds the UB2D. It outcompetes probe labeling. We can also throw this into cells, do a, a biotin click, abidin pull down, and we could show that we could pull out UB2D2 out of cells. Uh, but not unrelated proteins like GAPDH. And we've also done cysteine chemoproteomic profiling on EN67 and show that while this is not completely clean, uh, the cysteine 111 on UB2D is really the only target that's being engaged uh, among the ubiquitin proteasome system. So at least within the ubiquitin proteasome system, uh, it seems pretty selectively engaging that site. And so once again, we then linked EN67 onto the BRD4 inhibitor JQ1, uh, and we can show that this still binds again to UB2D, and this is able to now more robustly take out BRD4 uh, once again, showing this isoform selectivity, we're only taking out the BRD4 short isoform, not the long isoform. Uh, this is interesting because uh, previous studies have shown that it looks like the short isoform seems to have more oncogenic activity, while the BRD4 long isoform seems to have more tumor suppressive activity. So uh, this is a bit hand wavy, but uh, you know there could be therapeutic advantages for selectively taking out just the BRD4 short isoform while still maintaining the BRD4 uh, long isoform. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, previously we haven't really seen this kind of ice form selectivity and, and uh, you know, this, this uh, exploiting the E2 in this case seems to have that kind of selectivity. Um, we could see both time responsive degradation of BRD4 and that degradation of BRD4, just the short ice form, is uh, not surprisingly attenuated by either uh, proteasome inhibitor treatment or with a colon uh, methylation inhibitor treatment. Uh, and this is E2 dependent. So we do have to knock down all four uh, E2s, the UB2D1 through four, in order to get this rescue. But we could see that uh, the degradation of the short ice form of BRD4 is completely attenuated uh, by after, if you knock down all four uh, UB2D1 through four um, isoforms. And so it's on target activity. We've also applied this to other substrates outside of BRD4 because BRD4 is probably the easiest target to degrade. Uh, and so we've also taken Arvinus's uh, Protac AR ligand and linked it onto our E2 uh, recruiter. Uh, and we could show very robust uh, androgen receptor degradation in uh, androgen, uh, androgen sensitive LNK prostate cancer cells. Uh, nearly to the same extent as uh, ARV110. And uh, again, this uh, degradation of androgen receptor is attenuated uh, with a colon E3 ligase inhibitor. And when we do uh, quantitative proteomics on this degrader, uh, we get rather quite selective degradation of the androgen receptor across the proteome. Um, and so, um, you know, this, this was just 
an example case of, of where we can not only exploit, uh, you know, substrate receptors in colon E3 ligases or ring E3 ligases, but this shows us the possibility that we can engage uh, E2 ubiquitin conjugating enzymes, either molecular glue degrader interactions, or even exploit E2s also in PROTAC applications uh, as well. But uh, going back to kind of the, you know, molecular glues, um, you know, so I think many groups are now finding these molecular glue degraders uh, through phenotypic screens um, and, and that are cleverly designed, right? Um, and, it, and it turns out that these molecular glue degraders are, are much more common that, than we had originally expected. But so far, um, it's been more challenging to kind of rationally and chemically convert protein targeting ligands into molecular glue degraders. Um, and so this is something that we really wanted to tackle of whether there was any kind of chemical rational design strategy to be able to do this. And uh, we were really, really inspired by work, actually the majority of it coming out of uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, TPD uh, Center, as well as uh, Nico Thomas Group uh, and others where uh, there were many kind of fortuitous discoveries across the field where rather uh, minor chemical substitutions to otherwise non-degradative inhibitors like roscovitin against CDK12 or uh, this BI compound against BCL6, uh, rather minor chemical substitutions to those molecules converted these into molecular glue degraders of their targets or their target protein interaction partners. Um, and recently there were two really beautiful bioarchive studies that came out of uh, Ben Ebert and uh, Nat Gray and Eric Fisher's group, as well as uh, Garrett Winter and Alessio Trulli's group on, on also uh, a BRD4 molecular glue degrader and its mechanism in exploiting DCAF16. Uh, again, really uh, seeing these kind of very small structural changes on, on JQ1 that convert these molecules into molecular glue degraders of BRD4, where all of these studies indicated that maybe there are chemical rational design strategies to be able to do this. And so uh, Ethan Tariki in our lab, uh, who's a very talented chemical biology student alongside a postdoc in our lab, James uh, Papazimas, who's now working at Novartis, uh, took on this endeavor where we started uh, with very well-established drugs like ribociclib, that's a CDK4 and 6 inhibitor for breast cancer, uh, where we know exactly how this binds. There's crystal structures of this thing bound, and we know that this paparazine handle uh, is the exit vector pointing out of CDK4. And we started depending on various chemical handles to look for chemical handles that would induce the degradation of CDK4 as opposed to just merely inhibiting it. Um, and so uh, Ethan originally made uh, just nine compounds uh, because we really didn't know what we were looking for, uh, whether it be a reversible handle or a covalent handle. And so we tested a, just a variety of kind of carboxyl gases that we can couple onto this. Uh, and just from the first nine compounds that we made, we actually found the cinnamamide handle uh, that's actually a covalent handle, uh, you know, has this Michael acceptor here, uh, that when attached to ribociclib led to the degradation of CDK4 as opposed to just the mere inhibition. Um, and so this was really interesting to us. Uh, this was in fact degradation. Uh, that degradation of CDK4 was attenuated uh, if you pre-treat the cells with a, a, a proteasome inhibitor. And that covalent handle was necessary. If you reduce that covalent handle, so it's no longer reactive, you don't get degradation of CDK4 that you observe with uh, the original uh, reactive molecule. Uh, so because this is likely cysteine reactive, we map the uh, cysteine reactivity of this molecule using covalent chemoproteomic approaches. And you know this thing is not completely clean. Uh, this is uh, you know, has uh, several targets, uh, but there's only one target in this target list that was an E3 ligase. And that was this, uh, interestingly, zinc coordinating cysteine 32 uh, in this ring E3 ligase RNF-126. And we confirmed this direct interaction biochemically and also now through NMR studies, um, showing that this ESD1027 compound outcompetes uh, cysteine reactive probe labeling of pure RNF-126 protein at about 50 micromolar. It's not really that potent. Uh, and so we originally thought that this cinnamomide handle was reacting with RNF-126. This portion was binding to CDK4. We're gluing these together to ubiquitinate and degrade CDK4. Uh, consistent with that, uh, also we showed uh, by mass spec that we could also see the covalent addict of cysteine 32 on RNF-126. And uh, I'm not showing you the data here, but uh, we've also been able to show by 2D NMR studies in collaboration with Novartis uh, that this molecule is indeed binding pretty selectively to the zinc coordinating region uh, within RNF-126 without really distorting the RNF-126 structure or unfolding the protein or, or and, uh, you know, disrupting uh, its function. 
Um, and uh, to confirm that this was really happening through RNF-126, we've also been able to show that knocking down RNF-126 protein uh, completely attenuates the degradation of CDK4, at least with this uh, EST1027 uh, molecule and degrading CDK4. Uh, we also see that uh, RNF-126 uh, is also being lost as well. Uh, we believe that this is, you know, kind of stoichiometric with its uh, degree of engagement of RNF-126 in cells. And, uh, you know, for degraders that are operating at much lower concentrations, we don't necessarily see this RNF-126 degradation, but for the degraders that are operating at higher concentrations, uh, we do seem to also be taking out RNF-126. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, this all shows so far on target activity. And so uh, then we wanted to extend this to a really similar molecule. So we appended this uh, cinnamamide handle onto a really, really similar uh, Pfizer uh, CDK4 inhibitor palbociclib. Uh, and unfortunately, this now lost binding to RNF-126 and was no longer able to pick out CDK4. And so that was a bummer. We couldn't even transplant this onto an incredibly similar uh, protein targeting ligand against the same target. Um, and so we did a little bit more structure activity relationships, uh, first of all, playing around with our cinnamamide handle. And first of all, we found that the SAR was pretty tight. If you move the CF3 group to even the ortho meta positions, you, you already lose degradation activity. And if it's just an acrylamide handle, uh, you also don't get degradation. But we found that this fumarate handle uh, seemed to be more permissive. Uh, it was able to degrade uh, CDK4 more robustly. Uh, and this molecule with this fumarate handle attached to ribociclib was now a much more potent binder to RNF-126, now in the low micromolar, high nanomolar range. And so, uh, again, we were able to show that this binding occurs, uh, uh, you know, covalently on that cysteine 32 of RNF-126. Uh, we don't yet know whether it's, you know, attacking here or attacking here yet. Um, but nonetheless, it seems to be still binding to RNF-126. And now when we attach this fumarate handle onto palbociclib, we still maintain binding to RNF-126. And now uh, this shows CDK4 degradation. And so this seemed to be a more permissive handle, at least for CDK4. Uh, and so then we wanted to kind of see what was the minimum unit of both the original cinnamamide handle and also the better optimized fumarate handle that was leading to recognition of RNF-126. And uh, we found that with the original cinnamamide handle, we actually required quite a bit of the ribociclib core structure for this thing to recognize RNF-126. Uh, whereas with the fumarate handle, uh, as soon as you attach the perazine from ribociclib, uh, you restore binding to RNF-126 as if the entire ribociclib was bound. And, and really attaching more and more pieces of the ribociclib structure don't really help you in increasing potency against uh, this E3 ligase. And so it turns out that this portion is the minimum covalent handle you need uh, to bind to this E3 ligase. So basically the fumarate handle plus this paparazine. Uh, we also made an alkyne functionalized probe version of this uh, handle. Uh, I'll just note that this handle actually is substantially hotter as an electrophile than, than if you attach it to a whole ligand. But nonetheless, uh, this, this handle is able to covalently modify pure RNF-126 protein in a dose-responsive manner. You can outcompete that labeling with excess of the handle itself. And we can also do pull-down proteomic profiling experiments in cells. And uh, RNF-126 in this pull-down experiment is the most significantly pulled out E3 ligase. Uh, this handle is not completely clean, though. Uh, it does st start now pulling out some additional kind of ring E3 ligases as well, but uh, RNF-126 is one of the primary E3 ligases pulled out. And so then we wanted to see, you know, can we transplant this across a lot of different types of protein targeting ligands across different chemical classes as well as different protein classes. And so we first started with drugs that already had Perazines or other related heterocycles in their in their core structure. So we started, for example, with Glebec, uh, a BCR able and C able kinase inhibitor for leukemia, where it has this kind of perazine towards its exit vector. Uh, and so then we just depended on our fumarate handle, right? And and this it, molecule is able to take out not only the fusion oncogene BCR able quite robustly uh, in leukemia cancer cells, but also the parent kinase uh, C able as well. Uh, we also stuck this on to Pfizer's uh, Sudenafil or Viagra, uh, which also has a preparazine in its core structure. Uh, not that we really needed a better Viagra, but this molecule is able to take out phosphodiesterase 5 uh, as well. Uh, we also stuck this on to, for example, the BTK inhibitor Brutinib, and we're also able to take out BTK in cancer cells. Uh, we also stuck this onto a historemodeling complex inhibitor for SMARCA2, and we're also able to take out SMARCA2. Uh, and what, it's not shown here, but also, we can also take out SMARCA4 uh, as well. 
Uh, we also stuck this on to uh, the Denali Genentech LARC2 inhibitor for Parkinson's disease, and uh, we can moderately at least take out uh, LARC2 uh, in, in cells as well. And so then we wanted to uh, put this on to uh, protein targeting ligands that didn't already have a paparazine in, in its core structure, uh, such as JQ1, the BRD4 inhibitor. And uh, this degrader turns out to be uh, the best degrader that we have. Uh, we see nanomolar uh, degradation of both the long and short ice forms of BRD4. Uh, you can see that at the lower concentrations that we're not uh, that we're taking out BRD4, uh, we're not necessarily taking out RNF-126, right? But you can see that at higher concentrations, like 5 micromolar, uh, you can see that RNF-126 is also going down as well. Uh, when you do quantitative proteomics on this degrader, we see uh, rather quite selective degradation of BRD4 in proteomes as well. This is not necessarily the case with all degraders that that we're testing. Uh, um, uh, some of them do seem to show dirtier kind of proteome-wide profiles in terms of their selectivity, but, uh, you know, probably the selectivity garnered here is uh, also coupled with the fact that this thing is taking out BRD4 quite quickly and that we're able to see degradation uh, quite potently as well. We've also stuck this onto the HDAC, uh, pan-HDAC inhibitor varinostat, um, and we could see that HDAC1 and HDAC3 are taken out, but not, for example, HDAC6. Uh, in this case, also, we're not seeing necessarily BRD2 and BRD3 being taken out. It seems to be still, you know, somewhat selective for BRD4. Um, so there is some degree of kind of uh, preference and degradation here still, but uh, still, you know, we're seeing degradation across a lot of different protein classes. So then we wanted to go after a target that uh, was much more challenging uh, as a target to degrade. Uh, and this is uh, the truncation mutant of the androgen receptor, ARV7. Um, which has really been challenging, I think, to, to go after because the, the truncation mutant is basically missing the steroid binding domain, which is druggable. Uh, and all that's left is the intrinsically disordered DNA binding domain that's now constitutively activated to drive androgen-resistant prostate cancer cells. And uh, previous studies had reported this uh, DNA binding ligand against the androgen receptor that's still left over in the truncation mutant. And so we stuck that ligand onto uh, our fumarate handle and this molecule, both of these molecules are able to take out not only the wall type androgen receptor uh, in androgen, uh, androgen uh, uh, sensitive prostate cancer cells, but in androgen resistant prostate cancer cells, we can also take out uh, ARB7 uh, as well. And, and so this is really unique uh, in that, you know, we can now take out also the, the truncation mutant of this uh, pretty undruggable transcription factor. Um, and so, you know, what's really neat about this is that uh, this is still, I would say, quite early, we're still really working hard to optimize and, and reduce the electrophilicity of this uh, chemical handle. Um, but compared to the respective protax that are made against many of these targets, which are much larger in molecular weight, all of our molecules are substantially smaller in molecular weight. And we've been able to take out targets that probably no one cared to take out like phosphodiesterase 5, but also um, you know targets that have been challenging to take out such as uh, ARV7 as well. And so, we're pretty excited about this. Uh, we think that this is likely just the tip of the iceberg of other types of covalent handles that can be transplanted on the protein targeting ligand, convert these things into lower molecular weight uh, monovalent uh, degraders. Um, and uh, at least with this handle, we've been able to really show diversity of targets that can be taken out. Uh, the recent uh, Dana-Farber study uh, also showed that uh, a covalent uh, vinyl sulfonamide handle on JQ1 can also be used to take out BRD4 in a, in a really unique molecular glue interaction with uh, DCAP16. Um, and we're also starting to identify other covalent handles as well. Um, also taken more broadly, right, uh, we've identified many different covalent handles uh, that can be used in this case for a molecular glue to greater scaffold, but also for other examples in protech applications. Um, and I think uh, one outstanding question that we're now further exploring is whether we can use these handles as, as scaffolds for creating molecular glue degrader libraries, uh, much like, uh, you know, Celgene BMS have done for thalidomide and imid analogs, and now many companies are also kind of exploring that space, but can we get beyond imids and cerebron to create new molecular glue degrader scaffolds? Um, and so that's something that we're kind of actively exploring uh, currently as well. But going back to heterobifunctional modalities, you know, I think now that we have the capabilities of enabling ligand discovery against a much larger breadth of targets, 
we can now start thinking about developing recruiters for other effector proteins outside of degradation, including deubiquitinases or deacetylases or, or you know, many, many other types of effector proteins. And in fact, we've been able to develop recruiters against all of these now deubiquitinases, deacetylases, phosphatases, um, as well as, you know, methyl transferases or, or even deaminases and, and such. Um, but I'll show you one example with the ubiquitinase targeting chimeras or DevTACs for targeted protein stabilization, which are essentially the, the off targets of uh, protex, where, uh, or, or sorry, not the, uh, the opposite of protex, um, where there are thousands of disease causing proteins that are aberrantly ubiquitinated degraded to cause disease uh, that you wouldn't want to degrade further. You'd want to stabilize uh, and stop the degradation of those targets. Um, and the way to do that would be to develop a ubiquitinase or dub recruiter and link it onto a protein targeting ligand to induce the proximity of a dub to your ubiquitinated target protein to cleave off those ubiquitin chains to stop the degradation and stabilize your target of interest. Now, exploiting cysteine chemistry in dubs is quite tricky because most dubs have a catalytic cysteine, and if you targeted the catalytic site, you would just have a dead dub, and you couldn't recruit it to do its chemistry on, on neosubstrate targets. And so to start this project, we mined our ligandability database to look for deubiquitinases that had a more reactive allosteric cysteine than the catalytic cysteine. Uh, so not surprisingly, all the dubs that we profiled uh, had a uh, ligandable cysteine in it, uh, but uh, we were surprised to find that actually more than a third of the dubs had a more reactive, aberrantly, aberrantly reactive allosteric cysteine than the catalytic cysteine. And among those dubs was OTUB1, which is very highly expressed across nearly every cell and tissue type it's very permissive in its substrate scope, uh, but it's very, very precise for removing these K48 ubiquitin chains, which are the type of ubiquitin chains that destined proteins for degradation. And our ligandability database had shown us that this allosteric cysteine 23 was an incredibly aberrantly reactive cysteine by orders of magnitude more so than the catalytic cysteine 91. So we thought we could selectively target this allosteric site. And so we... Uh, took pure OTOB1 protein and we screened our covalent ligand library against it and we identified this molecule EM523 uh, that by mass spec uh, selectively engaged this allosteric, yet again an intrinsically disordered allosteric cysteine 23, but it did not touch the catalytic cysteine 91. And consistent with that, when you reconstitute the activity of OTOB1 in the presence of that activating E2, uh, looking at diubiquitin to monoubiquitin cleavage, we see that EM523 does not inhibit uh, dubiquitinase activity at all which is exactly what you want for a recruiter. You want a silent recruiter that doesn't inhibit the dub uh, activity. So then we wanted to apply this uh, to uh, actual working situation for proof of concept studies. And so we went after cystic fibrosis, where in cystic fibrosis, uh, this deletion in the sphenylalanine fibroid in the CFTR chloride channel caused this protein to become destabilized and aberrantly ubiquitinated and degraded through ERAD pathways. So they get less protein trafficking up to the cell membrane, and that causes the really lethal cystic fibrosis disease. Now, Vertex uh, has developed this really beautiful chemical chaperone drug, Lumicaftor, that helps CFTR protein stabilize a little bit better uh, so that you get a little bit more of this protein trapped up to the cell membrane. But a large fraction of this CFTR protein is still aberrantly ubiquitinated and degraded. So we thought a DoveTech could synergize with Lumicaftor. And so a very talented uh, chemical biology graduate student in our lab, uh, Nate Henning, uh, as well as uh, another chem bio student, uh, Lydia Boyke, uh, who are now uh, se senior scientists at uh, Vicinitas Therapeutics uh, uh, based on, our, on this technology, uh, formed these two DubTAC molecules originally, uh, linking our covalent OTOB1 recruiter EM523 onto the Vertex drug Lumicaftor via either a C3 linker uh, or a C5 alkyl linker. And we treated these in bronchial epithelial cells expressing the delta F5 void CFTR mutation. And we found that the C5 linkered uh, 57 molecule was able to really radically stabilize uh, CFTR protein levels compared to vehicle control or compared to the uh, Vertex drug Lumicaftor. And so this was quite exciting to us. Uh, this was very, very much linker dependent. Short linkers really, really don't work. It's really only the C5 linker and the C6 linker that are able to robustly stabilize CFTR. And as soon as you go longer than that with PEG linkers, uh, it also doesn't work. So this is very, very linker dependent, which is very analogous to Protex. We were also able to show ternary complex formation by native MS. Uh, showing that this molecule uh, is able to stabilize the OTOB1 CFTR ternary complex, uh, but we don't see that necessarily with the M523 treatment alone or with the vehicle. 
Uh, furthermore, that ternary complex seems to be required in cells. You can outcompete uh, the CFTR stabilization with excess lumocaptor or excess of the dove recruiter. Um, and furthermore, this seems to be on target. If you knock down OTOB1, you substantially attenuate uh, the stabilization response that you see in control cells. And by quantitative proteomics, uh, CFTR is really one of the, the top proteins that, that uh, go up uh, in these cells. Uh, you do see all these other red dots showing up that are also significantly going up with this DubTAC treatment. Uh, and they almost all turn out to be uh, proteins uh, that are heat shock proteins. And so we think that this is actually an on-target effect where uh, since you're elevating the levels of this relatively unstable protein to such a high degree, the cell's compensating by also uh, upregulating its own uh, chem uh, protein chaperones uh, to keep it stable as well. Now the question, right, is are we at, are we just accumulating all of this uh, CFTR protein at the ER and Golgi, or are we actually getting functional channel up to the cell surface? And so, in collaboration with Novartis's respiratory group, uh, we did chloride channel conductance studies in primary human donor bronchiothelial cells from cystic fibrosis patients bearing the delta F5 void CFTR mutation. And so, I want you to focus in on this middle part here, uh, where these cells have been treated in black with ibocaptor, which is the channel opener that patients are co-treated with uh, in, in combination with lumocaptor. And in green, our cells have been treated with ibocaptor plus lumocaptor, so chloride channel conductance goes up a bit more. And in blue, our cells have been treated with our DubTAC plus ibocaptor, so it goes up significantly more. Uh, and so this really shows us that we are actually getting functional channel up to the cell surface to improve chloride channel conductance uh, in, in um, uh, in these primary donor bronchial cells from cystic fibrosis patients. Now, um, you know, oftentimes, right, in academia, we oftentimes publish these floppy alkyl linker, you know, heterobifunctional molecules. But if you look at basically all of the, um, you know, protacts that have gone into clinical trials, uh, to, I think, make these molecules more orally available and, and have good PDPK properties, uh, you know, most of these molecules uh, have been converted to more rigid heterocycles. You can actually see this in the most recent disclosure from Nurex's uh, orally bioavailable BTK degrader as well. Um, and uh, so we've taken similar uh, steps to take the C5 alkyl linker geometry and replace that geometry with more rigid heterocycles and spirocycles. And we see that um, uh, several of these compounds like GL3 and GL8 show substantially improved uh, CFTR uh, stabilization like GL3 and GL8 here compared to the original 57 molecule, which in contrast actually seems, uh, you know, not, not as good. Uh, and so this is just in cells, right? So we're not even talking about metabolic stability of the compounds or PK properties. Um, we think that likely what's happening is that we're rigidifying the ternary complex that's being formed between CFTR and the dub, uh, enhancing its uh, stabilization activity. Uh, Going beyond CFTR, we can also show that this works with, for example, tumor suppressors as well, like Wibon kinase. So Wibon kinase is oftentimes aberrantly ubiquitinated and degraded in cancer cells uh, because it's a tumor suppressor that phosphorylates CDK1 to shut down its function to shut down cell cycle. Um, and so we took a Wibon kinase inhibitor and linked it onto our dub recruiter via various linkers. And we could show that these dub tacks are able to stabilize this tumor suppressor Wibon kinase as well in cancer cells to the same extent uh, as a proteasome inhibitor like bortezomib. Uh, and so we're pretty excited about this. We think we can go after a whole swath of previously uh, intractable proteins, including, you know, many tumor suppressors that are aberrantly degraded in cancer cells, as well as the many, many genetic disorders where mutations and genes leads to the destabilization and aberrant degradation of those targets, as well as haploid sufficiency targets, where maybe you only have 50% of a protein levels. Uh, and by slowing down its turnover and increasing the levels, even by a little bit, uh, you can have uh, transformative therapeutic effects. And so this actually came out of our uh, longstanding collaboration with Novartis, and uh, we've spun this out now as Vicinitas Therapeutics in South San Francisco, um, and we're off to the races on, on trying to uh, develop dub techs and targeted protein stabilization approaches uh, into drugs. And so uh, I'll just stop there. I think this is really the tip of the iceberg of other types of both uh, glue, uh, you know, degrader, glue stabilizer, glue whatever approaches or heterobifunctional approaches. Uh, that exploit induced proximity to be able to really tackle some of the most challenging disease targets that we have uh, in, in biology. Um, and that chemoproteomics uh, approaches can be used to either directly tackle on drug protein targets, but can also be used to expand the scope of targeted protein degradation platforms and also catalyze the development of new therapeutic modalities.
Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank my uh, really exceptional team of uh, you know, graduate students and postdocs and undergraduates uh, at UC Berkeley and the Innovative Genomics Institute. Uh, and all of the stories that I talked about today were through a collaboration with Novartis Berkeley Translational Chemical Biology Institute and was uh, really supported by um, uh, a lot of funding that we've also received from the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions.